a public sector facility, strict security, no margin for error, rooftop ground mount TNY carports, one active jail, a courthouse, and dozens of hidden underground hazards, with snow, steel, and bureaucracy all standing in the way. An American EPC dares to deliver their biggest solar project yet. One mistake could compromise lives, one delay could freeze the timeline. This is the story of a solar mission unlike any other. Watch it all unfold only on Sailing the Storm on ENF Trade TV. Hi, I am your host Rambak Chatterjee and you are watching Sailing the Storm only on ENF Trade TV. Joining me today are John, uh, Vice President Operations and Abraham, Commercial Development Manager from Michigan Solar Solutions. John, let's start with you. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself and your company. Uh, thank you very much. I'm super happy to be here and talk about this project today. Um, my name is John Chivaharian. I'm the Vice President of Operations here at Michigan Solar Solutions. I've been with the business for just about seven years now, so I um, spend a lot of my focus time uh, working with Abe, developing our commercial side of the business here at Michigan Solar Solutions. Hi, so my name's Abe Baiha. Um, I've been with Michigan Solar Solutions for about two years now, so I'm the commercial development manager here, um, and I pretty much help work with John and others to make sure that projects get developed in a thoughtful way on the front end, and also are closed out in a timely and efficient manner. Great to know you both. Now let's kick off the show by discussing a large scale installation challenge Michigan Solar has faced. Could you walk us through uh, the project details? Yeah, absolutely. So the project we're discussing is uh, this was for Eaton County's municipal campus, so uh, central county in the state of Michigan. Um, all of their campus uh, municipal buildings are all in one central location. So. This was a 1.1 megawatt system on aggregate, so spread out against a, uh, across a few uh, different systems. So we have the roof mount, you know, it's ballasted roof mount that was on the courthouse. Um, so that was about 195 kilowatts DC. And we also had two um, slightly larger carport systems, one for the health department building, it's about 221 kilowatts. Then we also had a very large carport for the county jail, which was about 443 kilowatts. And then rounding out, there was also a youth facility. That was that was the driven ground mount. Um, that was another 221 kilowatt system. So all that together, we were just just over about a megawatt all told. John, Michigan Solar has worked on multiple projects. Why did you choose this specific project for today's discussion? What made it stand out? We, as a company, took on our largest project ever that had four different mounting methods for four different systems on a site that is heavily regulated, right? This is a, a county municipal campus. One of our projects was interconnected at the county jail. I mean, we had to undergo rigorous requirements for tool checks to ensure that no screwdriver was missing at the end of the day, right? So you, you enter into this challenging scenario, and not particularly because solar is a very, very hard thing to do. It's not, it's the fact that we showed up to our biggest project ever, accepted the most rigorous uh, requirements for working and in on a site that is sensitive to our presence and we did a great job, right? So that's, that's really like the challenge and the overcome factor there. That's what really matters. And uh, now from a technical and economic perspective, tell me what solar panels, inverters and mounting systems did you use yeah. for this project and uh, what drove those yeah, choices? Absolutely. So when it comes to racking, right, we have, like I mentioned, four different racking methods. So we have pile driven I-beam steel ground mount, right? This is a 30 degree pitch here in Michigan. Um, and that product along with the carport products are actually made here in Michigan. So um, the rows are actually going from the north to the south and the system is a Y. And so on each of those parking spots, it's tilted to the east and the west. And so um, that's tilted at seven degrees because it's the most tilt we can get here in Michigan while maintaining the, the 10 foot 36 inch column in the ground and not having to be a larger column and obstruct parking. Uh, we then have the T-frame uh, carport. This is where we have the whole system actually facing south, right? Which is optimal for solar, we know this. Um, so that's, on a, that's at the health department site. 
And then lastly, we have a racking that is a ballasted racking. So this is 10 degree uh, Iron Ridge BX racking. And we chose this racking because 10 degrees allows us to get the most production year round while maintaining no roof penetrations. Uh, to complement the racking, we chose a module that would uh, not need to be additionally supported on the ballast racking. And so what we did is we chose a Jinko 410 watt module uh, that were being manufactured or assembled rather in Jacksonville, Florida uh, at the request of the customer. Um, uh, going along uh, with the racking and panels, uh, the inverters that we chose for this this project were uh, by Selectria. The courthouse was a little bit unique there because we also had to choose inverters to basically, um, we were limited. Uh, we had to do a load side connection there because there was no space in the existing service panel to do any kind of line side tap in any way. Um, so we we were dictated by the 120% rule, which is part of the, the code, that we could only do 200 amps of solar capacity at that site. So we were like, okay, how can we get exactly to that as much as possible? And in there, we did one Selectria 60 kilowatt inverter, as well as two Selectria 36 kilowatt inverters. But that would put it, that was a little bit too much. So we then had to derate those two Selectria 36 kilowatt inverters down to 30, uh, down to 35 kilowatts each. So that gives us, so that system was 130 kilowatts AC in total. But that was kind of a unique case of like, we were limited by the existing infrastructure. We couldn't upgrade it to make it feasible. It was not in the card. So we tried to figure out a combination with some derating to get at the maximum potential that we could there. What were the biggest environmental or logistical challenges you faced during the execution of this project? Could you elaborate a bit? Yeah, I think one really challenging thing here is that we were dealing with uh, a legacy municipal campus um, that had, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of underground facilities, whether they were active or whether they were abandoned or whether they were unknown or not um, in the ground. And so we had to hire really, um, really detailed private utility locators to then find everything. Um, another really challenging thing, I think, with this one, too, is that um, the carports had to be really considerate of um, the fact that some of these locations have freight traffic or like semi traffic that they had to deal with. So we had to get a little creative in that we had to essentially add a non standard rise, two foot riser to one side of the carports to basically, basically make one side slightly higher than the other side in, in orientation to allow for that freight traffic to still make their normal route and not disrupt or make the campus or the customer change how they were accustomed to doing stuff. Actually, two of two of our sites were of that level of security, right? There's the jail, the county jail, and there's also the youth juvenile detention center. They have inmates who, if they got a hold of a screwdriver or the wrong tool, could have a device to either cause themselves, others harm, or uh, potentially use it to escape, right? So like, you know, working in those environments was unique. And so the first point of intention in working that environment is let's, let's make a decision to have as little equipment or work that needs to be done in those spaces so that we can minimize the, the, the negative impact to our work effort. And so what would happen is we would, when, when we did need to work inside, we had to have a tool count, right? I'll also throw out there when we talk about environmental challenges, right? We have a winter in Michigan that has snow and ice for four to five months of the year. So with carports, right, traditionally the module is mounted to the purlin, directly to the purlin on the carport. And then there, between the modules, there is a gap. And there are products to go in the gap. There is a rubber gasket product, there is a tape product that can be put over the gap so that water doesn't drip through, right? Well, here in Michigan, the rubber, pro the rubber gasket product wears out very quickly because of the freeze-thaw cycle of the winter. So you would replace it in five to seven years if you use that product, right? And now, in Michigan, we have to have it waterproofed though because the dripping water in the winter creates a slipping hazard for anyone who's parked their car and is walking underneath the carport. But the customer didn't want recurring maintenance cost on their solar system. They didn't want to have to replace it and have a cost coming. So what we do is instead of mounting the solar panel to the purlin, 
we actually put a 28 gauge steel R panel on top of the carport. We have a bracket style connection, we have a rail, and we have a flush mounted solar panel. And what this does is it, with no recurring maintenance, causes the system to have a waterproofing. And now you're not dripping from between the modules, you're dripping only at the drip edge of that carport. When we add, doing all that, we added a significant amount of weight that is you know, not standard for these carports. So it even affected the foundation. We had to get a little bit more robust there as well and, and added some added cost there, right? It all is kind of a trickle down effect. A thing I'm curious about with multiple installation types, uh, rooftop, uh, ground mount, carport, uh, was there a shedding issue or was the site totally clear? No, shading is not really any part of the issue. Now, the, the other side of the coin here is that like, we always talk about shading for solar being bad, right? There was actually a, a couple places on this installation where we used shading to our advantage. For example, on the courthouse, we were able to mount the inverters on an adjacent building that was connected to it. So we put those inverters on the north facing side of that wall. And so those inverters, for their life cycle now will be shaded from the sun and therefore be able to operate at a lower temperature the fan will run less and it will likely have a longer life cycle and so like the cooling systems will also be much better off that's correct and so we use shading to our advantage there and also on the carports right we placed the inverters underneath the carports of course right so that when there is sun they are not in the direct sunlight to extend their life cycle Given Michigan's harsh winters, has snow accumulation affected performance since installation? Yeah, I think, you know, if there was anything related to this snow question, I'm glad you asked that. That was kind of something that we kind of learned from this and took away that like, okay, not only because of the snow and the freeze thaw in Michigan, not only do we need to take the other step to add these roof, you know, metal roof decking on top of these carports, we also really probably, if you want to have a perfect customer experience and if the cost can take it, it's also you probably want to add gutters to manage that that, that snow melt as well, and not create some kind of icing ish de icing challenge for the customer later on. Uh, public sector solar projects often face political and regulatory hurdles. What advice would you give uh, to other installers navigating government contracts? So when you're in a political space, you must speak to the reasons that are valuable to each individual and they're going to be different so you have to come prepared not to sell one dimensionally right you need to be able to encompass the entire breadth of value if you're going to work with a municipal campus as you said bureaucracy red tape everyone has different opinions but if you have some, a man on the inside so to speak that trusts you and knows what you're doing um that it really kind of speaks volume to getting the project over the hump. It's not just the primary benefits, right? It's it's honestly more importantly, and for here, those secondary and tertiary benefits that we were able to deliver to them um, that really made it made it made it sing to, to them at the end of the day. A lighter question: If you could go back to 2022, what's the one thing you would do differently to improve your project success? There is a an advanced monitoring system at each site, right? With a revenue grade meter, pyranometer, temperature sensor, uh, all aggregated to deliver the customer data, right? And so, like, that's a really cool thing for them. And you know, if the technology was around back then, I probably would have used a different product that gave them more insight into when should we and when shouldn't we call to have something fixed right right now the system shows them what it should be doing and what it's actually doing right but it doesn't monetize the value right so like it's not going to tell you okay if you wait three weeks it's going to cost you five hundred dollars doesn't do that so the system uh, essentially estimates the potential financial losses involved if the issues aren't resolved promptly and uh, then it uh, shows in layman terms Correct. You got to put it into terms that people are focused on, which is usually dollars and cents, right? So, I, yeah, that's a great point, John. I mean, it, yeah, if we would have had that ability then, I think it would have been awesome. Absolutely. They need a simplified dashboard you know, that provides a clear snapshot of what's happening, what's causing losses, and what immediately uh, requires maintenance. Correct. So a simplified version was what I would change. My final question, given the ongoing trade war and rising import tariffs, have you noticed a shift towards domestic solar and battery manufacturing? How are you handling the cost impacts? 
markets. I think the biggest impact with everything going on right now is that uh, markets don't like uncertainty. Customers making investment decisions don't like uncertainty. It's just been very turbulent and volatile. We don't know what's going to happen there. So like there are, there have been some cost increases that are going to start to come. We, we do kind of see that there. Um, we've been very, you know, very proactive in trying to get ahead of that with our supplier relationships and everything as much as possible. Um, but then there's certainly been a push even before any of that happening to domestic content anyway, due to the um, provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act. The volatility is the biggest issue, right? Uh, if you bought a solar system from us tomorrow, there's not a verifiable price increase yet, right? We just see it coming, right? We're hearing about inverter manufacturers, racking manufacturers, steel fabricators. The price is gonna go up, guys, right? But I will say that like here in Michigan, we are ecstatic about uh, the onshoring of domestic manufacturing of products uh, that, like Abe said, is not really a spur from the trade war, it's a spur from the Inflation Reduction Act. And we're just quite frankly thankful that that is about two years ahead of the current trade war shenanigans that are going on because if it wasn't, we would be in a much worse position, right? Yeah, and I, I one thing I would add too is that maybe not specifically the trade war, but Prey war specifically, but like the fact that everything has been changing, there's so much in flux right now. Like we don't know what's going to come out of the White House or out of the administration at any given time. Like it's very unpredictable right now. It's been a little bit unexpected. So that also kind of creates a little bit of uncertainty surrounding these incentives themselves. Like, you know, that ITC credit, it's a federal incentive, it's a federal program. But then like you see, we're slashing funding here, we're slashing funding there lot of phone calls that I've gotten over the last couple months about like, is this still available? Can I still do this? Is it's it's crazy. Um, and it, I think it kind of it creates some distrust uh, in like in that incentive even being available in the future, right? Um, like yeah, I say that's available now. It's good. It, it should be available, but people are more skeptical of it. I think now than ever. And like anything coming from the feds, I think they're skeptical of. So it's a little challenging. John, Abraham, thank you for sharing your insights and taking us through this complex project. This has been a fantastic episode and I appreciate you both joining us today. Yes, thank you for having us. We are happy to showcase our project and our company. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. This has been really awesome to talk about something that we're passionate about and that we continue to be passionate about and keep on growing and bring Michigan into the, the, ener the clean energy future. Securing and executing government solar projects isn't just about technical expertise. It's about understanding regulations, funding, how to work within public sector constraints, among many other things. Michigan Solar Solutions showed us today what it takes to navigate these challenges and deliver a successful municipal solar project. If you found this discussion valuable, make sure to like, subscribe and stay tuned for more real-world solar insights. Again, I'm your host Trambuk Chatterjee and you are watching Selling the Storm only on ENF Trade TV, your trusted source for all things solar.